Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus and Our Mental Health. Today is September 14th, 2022, and I'm Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Hale Eva on the North Shore. Today we have a very special program for you that I think you'll enjoy a lot, and that is the joy of writing. And uh, that will be a lot of fun. But first, I'm going to give you a little update on the coronavirus. Mostly good news, but of course, there's always some bad news to go with that. But the good news looks very good. If we take a look at the average number of new cases per day, uh, we're now at about 160, which is down from two weeks ago. The show two weeks ago, we were up about 300 and way down from our big numbers that we had at the beginning of the year. So uh, now we're still not to our lows. Our lows ran about 50 cases uh, per day, and that was in March. So we haven't reached there, but we've been steadily going down. So that's good news for us in Hawaii. The other good news for everybody in the US is that we've got a new weapon to fight the coronavirus. And that is a bivariant vaccine and a booster shot. And it's coming to us from both uh, Pfister and from uh, Moderna. And uh, they're all set to go with that. The FDA came out with it, uh, talked about it last uh, two weeks ago in our last show. And then the CDC followed that up by uh, showing the where we can give it out to and when we can give it out to, the timing and everything, the guidelines. So we're all set to go. And uh, everybody has a lot of uh, you know shots ready to go. So it's no, wor no worry about the quantity. Our worry is about the distribution. And here's what's been happening. Uh, and you've seen it around you in that, compared to the first year, compared to 2020, uh, and especially uh, when we had that big spike this past uh, holiday thing, uh, we've been doing a lot better. And as I mentioned two weeks ago, the virus is sort of like an offense when we're if we're playing sports and we're on defense. And defense is always behind offense. Well, with these new boosters and vaccines, uh, we've got a much stronger defense uh, because it's a bivariant uh, shot which means that it uh, has all the good qualities of the shots that we've been taking, uh, which were modified and uh, you know, done for the original coronavirus. Plus it's got a, you know, working against the bivariant, uh, uh, the, the variants of Omicron. And those, can, uh, those mean uh, BA4 and BA5. And we haven't had that before. So now we've got a new weapon against them. The problem and the downside of this is because we've been doing so well, not so much in number of cases, but we've been steadily reducing the number of people who are going into the emergency room and the number of people who are dying. Because of that, uh, we've relaxed our other weapons against the coronavirus. Uh, we've done away with a lot of our mask uh, requirements, uh, with our requirements for quarantine, with requirements for social distancing, and those were really pretty effective. That was one of the things that caused us to keep going down. Well, you know, we're much more relaxed in those. The other thing is our funding has gone down because when the federal government looks at it, it says, well, we're looking good. I mean, the cases are still up, the new cases are still up, but it's not as deadly as the other cases. It's just highly infectious. If, <laughs> in, in, has an infection rate that's much higher than normal. Uh, so, you know, that's okay, we can deal with that. So a lot of funding has been reduced, which means that uh, the number of places and the number of staff that can hand out these shots have been reduced. Now, here's the good news though. I went to the uh, Department of Hawaii, Department of Health this morning, and from their website, it's clear that we seem to have a good amount of shots available enough to cover anybody who wants the shots or who needs the shots. So we seem to be in a much better position than some of the other uh, states in the United States. So that's a good thing, but it's something that we've got to really be, you know, keep in our scope because uh, the coronavirus is not going away. We're still gonna have lots of cases coming up and some of those cases are long COVID cases and that can be really serious and really 
debilitating. So we just have to be really careful and keep our defense going. We're not ready to become an endemic yet. We're still in a pandemic. Now, let me get to the good part, the really good part. And that is what I've been talking about is our medical uh, defense against the coronavirus. Uh, this show is focusing on our mental health defense against coronavirus. So what we've been doing uh, in the last couple of months is we've been focusing on positivity because coronavirus and the other dark clouds in our sky, including climate change, which is a big one, uh, the war in Ukraine, the mass shootings that we're going under, it's very easy to get mired in negativity, to be depressed, to be anxious. So we're looking at positivity and we're looking at things that bring joy. And today, we're gonna to talk about the joy of writing. And to do that with me and to help me out is Penny Smith, who's a good friend of mine and an author. And welcome to the program, Penny. Well, thanks so much, Ken. It's always so much fun to talk with other storytellers about good storytelling. <laughs> yeah, and Penny and I have been telling stories for a long time together because we're both regular members of the Windward Community College Writing Retreat. And we've been there and known each other for a number of years. The thing is, Penny's way ahead of me in that she's recently had books published, which I'm far away from. So she's had a, a two books published, one in 2020 and one in 2021. The Last Leg Woman was the one from 2020, and the one that you're seeing now is Sunset West, and that was just done last year. Uh, so Penny's not only got the joy of writing, but he's got, she's got the joy of distributing her writing uh, to other people. So that's a good place to start, Penny. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your new books. Oh, well, thanks. Um, I think the pandemic was one of the things that allowed me to really delve into them and to, to start uh, to write them. But when you talk about the joy of writing, for me, uh, just connecting with people I haven't connected with in a long time because I have something to talk about and I have something to share has been just great. I mean, um, I've reconnected with lots and lots of friends over the last couple of years that, you know, I didn't have any particular reason before, but um, the first book, The Last Leg Woman, kind of recounts the experiences I had as a young writer many, many years ago when I covered the entertainment industry um, First of all, as the leg woman for a very famous gossip columnist, and then went on to my own uh, bylines and whatnot. I spent about 12 years doing that, the last five of them with the New York Times Special Features Syndicate. And that was our whole world was chasing around what was going on in Hollywood. And uh, you don't talk a lot about it when you become you know, an adult far away from it because people think you're dropping names, you're being arrogant. So I just got to thinking about, well, it would be a lot of fun to be able to go back to some of those experiences and use them as just incentives, uh, kind of inspirations. And I love mystery stories. I read a lot of them. So I started writing the first one and uh, it, that's how they came about. And uh, it's been a, just a, a lot of fun for me and, and a tremendous, uh, I guess you would say, uh, motivation to just keep writing. That's terrific. Uh, well, you came out with one in 2020 and 2021. Are we, is there another one coming out uh, this year in 2022? Of course. It's now at the proofreaders. We've been through the, the, the beta readers, which means those are the folks that read the original manuscript that you trust that kind of represent your marketplace and come back and say, you know, this just doesn't work. <laughs> you know? <laughs> or as one of mine used to say to me, um, you bury the lead, <laughs> you know, you've got a chapter that's going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but now, uh, I'm really, guessing this is going to be a big series then, that uh, well, probably it, this year is not going to be the last, but we get to look forward to 2023. Well, we'll see, you know, <laughs> the thing about writing is there's so much Im imagination involved and you kind of have to figure out, you know, where can we go next with this? And, and, um, to quote a couple of other writers, um, Janet Ivanovich, who, who does the, uh, um, it's, it has been one is for something, two is for something, three is for something, made the comment that she never ages her characters. So consequently, her readers started to add up the number of years that she's been writing, and she said their character would be about 70 years old, but she's frozen her entire <laughs> mid-30s. 
I started mine out really advancing her age. So consequently, at some point, you have to stop because she's just going to be a little too old to be doing what she's doing. <laughs> 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 but well, uh, the, the, the nice thing is that one of the recent books we had uh, for one of my book clubs was uh, the Thursday uh, Murder Club, uh, well, which the uh, which the main characters, the heroines and heroes, were in their late seventies and early eighties. So uh, they were still going strong and still brilliant in that book. So yeah, I think that, that you can keep your characters going strong and brilliant as you go along. Yeah, well, we certainly hope so. <laughs> 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 Maybe we could talk more about uh, the writing because I know a lot of people. In fact, most everybody that I meet would like to write something. You know, you sort of have that in your back of your mind. Gee, I'd like to to write this. You know, uh, but very few of them ever do. And uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about how this all falls together. How the uh, you know the characters. You know how you you know the char characters take shape. The plot takes shape. Um, the place, you know, the setting takes place and how that all affects it. And how do you keep them all straight and bring them all together for a novel? <laughs> well, you know, that's really interesting. David Mamet, who is, a, you know, a very well-known novelist and also screenwriter, I heard him recently describe this process when you're talking about bringing them all together. He said there are, there are writers who are farmers and there are writers who are gardeners. The farmers plan it all out, just, you know, like the crops. We, we know we have seasons, we know, and they have it all scheduled out with budget and the whole thing. The gardeners say, well, oh, gee, I, I, I got this idea for a really pretty garden with lots of pretty colors, and uh, but I got some seeds, so let's just plant them and see what happens. And that's kind of how people write. I'm a gardener, <laughs> but a lot of people are not. Um, and I guess it... It depends on how you yourself kind of organize your own thoughts about that. I started out with just a concept. Um, I worked for a very powerful, very omnipresent woman. And I always wondered when I worked for her, for her what would happen if she died or if she went away? Because there's all this, pop not paparazzi, but, uh, you know, community around her that interacts with her. What would happen if she wasn't there all of a sudden? Where would these people go? I was one of those people. So when I started writing this book 27, 30 some years later, that was my premise. The big dude died. You know? And what happened to the little dude? And then where did it go from there? That was my premise. But then again, uh, you know, I'm helping a, a, a friend, a colleague who's really writing a memoir about a really exotic time in her life where she lived in a lot of exotic places, but for an interesting reason. And her whole point was really to dis describe the wonderful places she lived. And she, you know, she follows because she has a, a natural chronology of when she was at these places. And, uh, and that's really where, you know, kind of where her mind is at. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, how you imagine, how you, how you see things. Um, to me, that's, maybe one of the most important parts of this is the ability to imagine however you imagine. You know, if you imagine in numbers, that's one thing. You imagine in colors, imagine in people, but if you're writing, that's kind of how you start put, putting your arms around it. Let that's terrific. That. And that leads me to my next question, because so many people not only think that they want to write a book, but... Uh, they get discouraged, they run into problems and they just set it aside, you know? Yeah. And uh, I can't even begin to tell you how many friends I have that have started something and myself included, have never finished it because these problems come up. And, you know, how do you uh, help people? Because everybody like you're pointing out is different. They're in a different sphere with different experience and different desires on how they want this thing to go. But when they run into these roadblocks, uh, how can they get over these? What are, what are some uh, other ways uh, that you can get over these roadblocks and actually get st stuff down on the paper, which you really want to do? Well, you know, Ken, I think it's, it's kind of like self-help or help in many ways. Um, 
if it's new to you and you really want to do this and you're serious about wanting to do this, you know, you and I belong to one of the greatest support groups I've ever known, truly, for writing. Um, and yet, well, during the pandemic, when we weren't meeting, I had a five-person support group. Different neighborhoods I've lived in, you know, people get together and, and, and they write together. And it's an excuse to write. I mean, it's not an excuse, it's a discipline. I know that on Sunday afternoon at four o'clock, I'm going to write. And if I can schedule that, sometimes that's easier to do than sitting down yourself at any time and continuing because you're, you're stumped. But if you've got some help, that's one way. That's one way. Um, another one, and I can't remember who it was. It was another someone like a David Mamet said, well, I just glue my butt to the seat and just keep fighting. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, great. It's kind of discipline. <laughs> I know I shouldn't. I know I'd like to go out and do something, but I got to get this done. <laughs> Yeah, you're certainly, it's certainly right about different ways that people have to do this. I think a real critical thing is have supportive friends like you are to these people uh, who keep them, to keep encouraging them, you know, through the, uh, the rough parts, because there's always going to be a rough part when you're writing something. Yeah. Even if you have a time, like I, my time is in the morning. So, uh, you know, I got to do it in the morning, you know, and, uh, and that's great. But, uh, you know, that friend support is uh, is is terrific. Uh, now I'm sure that with some of your friends who want support, you, that you wind up reading some of their st their stuff. So that uh, certainly, but you know that, that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. <laughs> no, but but you know what? I mean, everybody has think about think about writing a piece of writing like a piece of art, and everybody's yeah. different. And so, you know, if you would respect that and say, well, this isn't how I would have written it, and it's certainly not in the style that I like, but let me suggest some things to you. And, you know, it's really their, their, it's their writing. And you can help them, you can suggest, but um, just respect that they're doing their best. <laughs> they're trying, you know, not everyone does that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I loved your analogy of the, uh, the gardener and the farmer, because <clears throat> I'm definitely a gardener too. And I think the real joy for me in writing is to see what comes up, you know? <laughs> it's like you've got seeds, but you don't know what the seeds are. <laughs> so you're, you're finding them in the ground and they can come up to a big sunflower. They can come back to, you know, just real delicate flowers are, and you're sitting there saying, wow, I didn't think it was gonna go this way. I don't <laughs> think it was gonna come up this way. <laughs> And that really is uh, great fun. It's just great. Uh, but then on the other hand, it's also can discourage you for you saying, gee, that wasn't what I expected. Now I don't know what to do. You know? <laughs> so you know, I just try to tell people, let it, let have fun with it. But it's, it's hard, easy to say, but hard to do. But hard to do. I agree with that. I, this next, the, the book that has is just been worked on right now, really the, I guess you would say the, the direction for that um, sort of came about by a quote that I use at the end of the book. And then I had to back away from that and figure out well, how do we get to that? So then I said, well, there is a locale that I have wanted to use forever um, to place my character in this one locale. And, I, and I'm not, I won't make, a, make it a big surprise. I mean, I used to drive, take the train in Northern California and buy the um, Swiss and Bay ghost ships. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's where, where the military used to put all of their um, discarded ships. And at the time I was going by, there were, at least according to what I understand, there were 66 of them stacked up. I mean, it was astounding to look at this. And I kept thinking, what a great locale to, to focus someone on. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's how I started this out, saying, here's the end of the book, and here's where I want to be. Somehow or other, we've got to get the two of them together. You know? But I also tend to think that, again, people have a way of organizing their own mind. In my mind, my books and, and a story kind of a, a, with a character as the center point has kind of three, three sections. The first one is, um, what they're doing, 
And I mean, in this case, mine is a journalist and she's, you know, she's covering stories and we've got to have that world in there to give her purpose. The second thing is how she relates to that world as a professional, as a, in this case, a young woman, um, blah, blah, blah. And the third one is who is she as a person and what is her personal issue? What are her personal issues? And all three of those have to work together. So, you know, there's context that can be placed between <laughs> the ghost ships and this last quote. <laughs> so that's how I look at it. But again, I remember the stories of Jackie Suzanne, who wrote on um, the Valley of the Dolls and a whole bunch of other. Yeah. Used to do a massive, massive ex uh, kind of frame and, and grid for every single book. And I couldn't do that. I mean, that, that would drive me crazy. But that's how different writers can, you know, take different ways. Yeah, I think finding your own way is is hard. It's easy for us to tell people to find their own way, but it's hard to, to do that. Uh, you know, I was just a quick aside. Uh, I wasn't familiar with the ghost ships. I, you know, I'm from Southern California, so uh, familiar with that. But I'm also familiar because I was in the Air Force. I was familiar with the Arizona area where they have all the ghost airplanes. Planes. Yeah, stocked up there. And, you know, and you can walk out on one of the fields there, I forget which field it is, and see hundreds and hundreds of these old Air Force planes there, you know, sitting there deserted. So, you know, I thought, well, geez, there's another story. <laughs> you know, the ghost air airfield, you know. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm i very visual. You know, everybody has kind of a different perspective of how they look at things, but, um, I'm very visual. I, I see I see my characters and I see you know scenes playing out, and consequently, if I can come up with a really interesting you know location or some kind of a scenario that that, that really pulls you in visually, um, I frequently. Uh, Do you ever have any problem with uh, this uh, visual sense? Um, because we've been around a while and yeah. so we've got lots of memories and have lots of experiences and you know the first thing I thought of when we're talking about this and I mentioned the ghost airfield was I remember back to an old Ad Avenger Avengers uh, episode with a deserted airfield in England after World War II very strange uh, story and I thought you know these all these memories everything that you say kicks off something in my head yeah. And if we're writing a book, it also kicks off stuff. So, I mean, it's like uh, I worry sometimes about planting too many seats and everything's coming up and I'm looking around and saying, you know, where, where do I start picking? What do I use? Yeah. It's true. You ever have that problem? Oh, yeah. I, and, and when I send books out to the beta readers and they come back and like one guy said to me, I didn't think this scene was even necessary. We figured out who did it. Why can't we just get on to the party? <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> That's got to be difficult with writing mysteries, though, is to keep your readers in suspense, but not uh, not be too far out, right. but you know? give them the foreshadowings at the beginning of the book so that when they finish, they say, you know, I should have known that because she told me early on in the book. Right. Right. That's an easy thing to say, but a hard thing to do. Well, it is. And I think of every chapter, as my, my friend who was a journalist told me, that chapter didn't go anywhere. You buried the lead. And I remember every chapter is a story of its own. <laughs> so you've got to keep that sort of thing going. <laughs> the other thing that I have trouble with is I get to a certain spot and I want to put something in. And then I think to myself, if I'm going to put this in, I need some foreshadowing back in some previous chapters. Yep. And then I have to go back and add that to that chapters. And it's like a never ending process. How do you, how do you deal with that? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it's comfortable for me. I, and I know it isn't for a lot of people, um, but that's part of the, the challenge of it. I really, I really like the challenge of digging into it and making it, you know, tying it together. Oops, we forgot something that's over here. We better, you know, wrap that up here. But uh, I know that that's hard for other people. I just have no luck. <laughs> well, you know, I think that you have an advantage in that you're a very positive person. And that's, that's terrific. I wish I could make more writers uh, and everybody else in the world more positive so that uh, you can enjoy it more. It's, 
you know, if you start worrying about those things, like you say, uh, yeah. it becomes a chore. Uh, and a lot of people see, see his writing as a chore. You know, part of that's uh, hooked up with our jobs. Yes. A lot of us are in jobs that have to do a lot of writing. Yes. And uh, it's hard for them to think of it not as a chore, but as a joy. Any, any ideas on that or thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's an attitude about any kind of creativity. I mean, whether you're, you know, writing or graphic design or anything. I mean, um, and I really believe that we, there is a muscle inside of us for creativity and for imagination. And most, not most, many people do not ever develop that muscle. Um, you know, you look at a, a, a scene and you describe it exactly as you see it with absolutely no interest in bringing out what else might be there. Yeah. And, uh, um, and I, that's, I think that's part of, I don't know why I got developed to that. I, I want to think it was the nuns in first or second grade or something, but I don't know. But that's part of the problem when people sit down and they think, well, where am I going to go from here? I've described the scene, now what? You know, and uh, it's, it's the imagination. It's being able to use that, whether it's a mathematical imagination. We have a colleague that is in our uh, group at Wynwood Community College. I've seen her artwork, and she uses a protractor to, to do faces and things like that. I couldn't even imagine that, but it's wonderful. So right. you know, that's where her imagination has been developed to. But uh, yeah, I think you just have to say, hey, it doesn't matter. I'm going to write what is there. And if it doesn't look like the picture, I think it should. Well, that's me. That's mine. Yeah. That's terrific. Uh, <laughs> Benny, we're running, I'm running short on time. In fact, we've got about a minute left. I wanted to check in to see if there's any final thoughts before we say aloha. Well, just mostly that do it, you know, write it. Um, we have lots of people around who have shown us that just sitting down and even doing a memoir turns out to be a joy. And I think that's kind of what we're looking at is uh, make it joyful. You know? you know, that's one of the things I find in the writer's workshop. Uh, the writing retreat that we go to out at the Windward thing is it gives you, it, you know, you no longer have an excuse because you're there and you need to write. And you have an hour, hour and a half of just writing. And some of those people say, this is the only time I get to write. That's it. And they're there because they really want to write. Yeah, exactly. So you're absolutely right. Even if you just describe the day, you know, do something that helps you get out those feelings and that, uh, that, that creativity. Absolutely. Penny, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, I look forward to continuing uh, being with you in the writing retreat and other venues where we can have a chance to write together because it is really stimulating and wonderful. Absolutely, Ken. It's been my pleasure. And knowing you're a good Southern California boy, I will bring you the next book as soon as it's done because it's all about Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And I was born in Hollywood, so I got lots of questions about Hollywood. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. And I'd like to say uh, aloha to all the people who helped us today. Uh, Eric and Jay and Haley and Michael, uh, thank you for all your support here. And thank you, listeners who are out there. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the show. If you've got any questions, please uh, give us an email or whatever, and uh, we'd be happy to respond to that and, uh, you know, and try to deal with whatever, not only questions, but comments that you have as well. So everybody, thank you and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.